if you remember last week, we did our introduction into the book of Isaiah by showing you how a New Testament writer, in this case, Luke, in the book of Acts, used Isaiah to inform us about the Ethiopian eunuch, correct? And we got to see some amazing promises fulfilled in the eunuch's life as we followed his journey uh, through the book of Isaiah. So we're going to go to the beginning of Isaiah this evening. So we'll be in Isaiah 1, if you want to go there. Do we want to put another finger maybe in uh, Mark 4? We'll stop there. And I think John 12 and 13 will be there as well. Kind of guessing because I put a sticky note in here with all my places. And it's not here anymore. So if you see a sticky note with any Bible verses on it, you might want to run up here real quick with it. That's very interesting. All right. Okay, so let's pray, and uh, we'll see what the Lord has for us tonight. Father, it's in Jesus' name that we come to you. Lord, uh, just thankful for what you showed Isaiah, because Lord, we see a picture of your son in ways that we wouldn't otherwise see. So we celebrate that. And Lord, seek to um, find you tonight in new ways. So bless us as we study your word. Uh, we give all of the credit and all the glory to you. Lord, we love you. We serve you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Isaiah chapter 1. Okay, we begin. It says, The vision of Isaiah, the son of Amos, which he saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem, in the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah. All right, so we have Isaiah. Now we see who he's the prophet for. He's the prophet of the southern kingdom of Judah, and the metropolis of Judah is Jerusalem. So these are visions of Judah and Jerusalem. Now this is, of course, after the kingdom was divided after Solomon. You had uh, Rehoboam as the southern king over Judah. You had Jeroboam as the northern king uh, in that original division of the land. And as that division continues now, we're going to see Isaiah become the prophet of the southern kingdom here. He will mention the northern kingdom, of course, quite a bit, uh, as well as other nations. But he is the prophet of the southern kingdom of Judah. During the reigns of the four kings there, Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah. Now, what king follows Hezekiah in Judah? Well, it's the king that's been regarded as their most evil uh, king, Manasseh, King Manasseh. Because tradition tells us that Manasseh ordered the death of Isaiah. And... He had him, uh, it's believed that he had him put into a hollowed out log and sawn in two. So as we read the book of Hebrews, as it celebrates the heroes of the faith, when he concludes that chapter, he starts saying, time doesn't allow me to mention those that quenched fire, closed the mouth of lions, conquered cities, did all these heroic things. And then it mentions some of the sufferings that they went through, including some of them were sawn asunder, and we believe he had Isaiah in mind when he mentions that fate. So, verse 2 says, Hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth, for the Lord has spoken. So now, who is he calling as witnesses to the oracle that's going to follow? Heaven and earth, correct? Now, why would he call heaven and earth as witness to what's going to follow? Well, Isaiah especially gives prophecies in the form of an already fulfillment and a not yet fulfillment. So there's going to be truth about his prophecies that his, his immediate audience will experience some of the fulfillment of that prophecy, but it's all sort of a shadow to point to a future prophecy that will not be fulfilled in their lifetime. And so, therefore, the only witnesses that can testify to the dual fulfillment is the heavens and the earth, right? So, in the Torah, back in the first five books, God actually said he'll call heaven and, and earth as a witness uh, against his people when they rebel. So, we see here uh, heaven and earth being called as witnesses for
for the Lord has spoken. And here's what he says. I have nourished and brought up children and they've rebelled against me. Now that's heartbreaking when that happens, isn't it? It's truly heartbreaking. You nourish children, you bring them up. And then when they rebel, it's, it's a very painful thing. Uh, this is, uh, reminds me of John 1, when the apostle John tells us that Jesus came to his own and his own did not receive him. Imagine how much pain is involved with that statement. He came to that which was his own, and his own did not receive him. So here we see God saying, I've nursed and brought up children, and they've rebelled against me. Verse 3, the ox knows its owner, and the donkey its master's crib, but Israel does not know. My people do not consider. So here it's saying, listen, the ox and the donkey. Now, these are two animals that we use in reference to stupidity, right? He's as dumb as an ox, right? Okay, I've heard that said of me. And um, even more frequently, we say somebody could be a dumb ass, correct? All right, so these are the two an animals known for being stupid. And so what is God saying here? He's saying, here's what the ox knows. He knows his owner. And here's what the donkey knows. He knows his master's crib. Some of your versions say manger. He knows his master's manger, okay? But he says, but Israel does not know. Does not know what? Its owner or its master's crib. Saying Israel is dumber than the dumb animals because they don't know who their master is. They don't know who their, where their sustenance comes from. Okay, they don't know their source. But the donkey and the ox know. They instinctively know that stuff. And it's saying Israel has become dumber than these dumb animals. So if you look at ancient um, Orthodox art, they often, if not always, include the donkey and the ox in their manger scenes. Uh, can we pull that up, gentlemen? Is it up? Can we pull up the uh, picture, guys? Okay. All right. So there you see the, the donkey and the ox peering into the manger or crib of Jesus, correct? And that's not unusual for you to see, is it? You've often seen the donkey and the ox peering into the crib. Now, as I was looking for a picture to show you guys, there are comments under these pictures of this is so false. Uh, and for, for Jesus was born, there'd be no donkey, there'd be no ox. This is just, you know, you can't trust this material. It's, it's untrue and all that. Listen, the, this art is not saying there was a donkey and an ox at the manger scene. This art is pointing you to Isaiah 1.3. It's saying, see the donkey and the ox recognize their master's crib. Okay, it's not trying to give you a Polaroid of the manger scene. All right, it's trying to tell you um, the fulfillment of a verse. Uh, just like there's a wonderful Last Supper painting that includes a dog underneath the table where the apostles and Jesus are eating. And he's, he's licking up the crumbs that are falling from the master's table. And what is that telling you? Well, what did Jesus and the Syrophoenician woman, what was their conversation? She said, I, my daughter needs healing. He says, I've only come to the lost sheep of Israel. And she said, but even the dogs, because they were called Samaritan dogs by the Jews, said, even the dogs get the crumbs that fall from the master's table. And Jesus looked around and said, I haven't seen great faith like this in all of Israel. Okay, so he was provoking her to show the Jews her wonderful faith as a Gentile. So the dog under the last supper table is that artist's rendition of Gentiles are welcome at that supper where we partake of the body and blood of Christ. I think that's the last supper painting that should be up on everybody's wall, even over uh, Da Vinci's. But anyways, so here you see uh, the ox and the donkey recognizing their master's crib. They know who their master is as they gaze into his manger. But Israel does not know, my people do not consider. Verse four, alas, sinful nation. So here comes the words of judgment. See, when you don't recognize your master, you don't recognize who created you, you become a sinful nation, a people laden with iniquity, 
a brood of evildoers, children who are corruptors. They have forsaken the Lord. They have provoked to anger the Holy One of Israel. They have turned away backward. All right, so here we have um, this initial, these initial words of judgment toward Jerusalem and Judah. And what is the big charge? That they simply do not realize um, who God is. They're not recognizing God's role in their life. So God continues through the prophet Isaiah saying, why should you be stricken again? You will revolt more and more. The whole head is sick and the whole heart faints. From the sole of the foot even to the head, there is no soundness in it, but wounds and bruises and putrefying sores. They have not been closed or bound up or soothed with ointment. So what does the sinful condition of God's people look like? He gives this physical direction. Uh, description of what their sin actually looks like. It looks like sickness from head to toe, where the whole head is sick, the whole heart faints, from the sole of the foot even to the head, there's no soundness to it. There's only wounds and bruises and putrefying sores that are not cared for. They're not closed or bound up. They're not soothed with ointment. They are uncared for, open wounds. They are bruises from head to toe. This is the spiritual condition of Israel. And my question for you is this, what would it take to redeem that? That you would actually look at, God can actually look at the character and the sinful uh, situation going on with Israel. Say, so you know what you look like right now? You look like open wounds, putrefying sores, bruises from head to toe. Your whole head is sick. Your entire body, there's no soundness in it. This is what you look like morally and spiritually. So what would it take to make that clean again, to make that whole again? Well, what it's going to take is somebody being able to take all of that upon himself, all the bruises upon himself, all the wounds upon himself, so that the one he takes it from can be clean again, right? As if they were never sick, okay? Everybody realize what I'm pointing at, okay? All right. It's the cross, in case you're sitting there going, I don't, but I don't want to say it out loud now, right? It's the cross, right? He takes all of our ugliness upon himself there. Verse seven, your country is desolate. Your cities are burned with fire. Strangers devour your land in your presence, and it's desolate. It's overthrown by strangers. So, so the daughter of Zion is left as a booth in a vineyard, as a hut in a garden of cucumbers, as a besieged city. So you have these garden images of a garden of cucumbers. You have a vineyard. And the people there are left as a booth in a hut. And the idea there is it's not, it's not sturdy. It's flimsy. It's not going to be able to stand the storms. It's not a house built on a rock, correct? This is very, very vulnerable hut and booth in these gardens now because their spiritual condition. Verse 9, unless the Lord of hosts had left to us a very small remnant, we would have become like Sodom. We would have become like Gomorrah. Now, by the way, I just saw an article in Forbes magazine. I think it was written in 2017-ish. And I saw it cited other magazines like Science America, uh, some other magazines, where, and I actually saw a video of the lead archaeologist. Uh, it's a woman, I don't remember her name, but they are doing this dig in southern Israel, right at the spot understood to be Sodom and Gomorrah. And what they found, they describe as this it's a city that must have been struck by a meteor because everything is ash. Everything is burnt. And because of they're just not believing the Bible, they said it had to be a meteor. But as all the looks of the Bible's description of Sodom and Gomorrah being burned to the ground, and these aren't Christian magazines. Okay, this is just saying we believe a meteor hit this, this part of southern Israel here, even though we don't find a crater. So that's pretty remarkable. So if God didn't leave to us a very small remnant, we would have become like Sodom. We would have become like Gomorrah. Now, 
What's the key difference between the destruction of Sodom and the destruction of Gomorrah? The only difference is that I can pick up on is Lot and his family were rescued out of Sodom. I don't know of any rescue out of Gomorrah at all. That just seems to be total destruction. Yet Lot and his family become a remnant. And that's what this verse is talking about. If God doesn't leave a remnant, we'd be like Sodom and Gomorrah. Okay. So with that, verse 10 says, hear the word of the Lord, you rulers of Sodom. Give ear to the law of our God, you people of Gomorrah. To what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifices to me, says the Lord. So here he's acknowledging you have this outward obedience of, of the multitude of your sacrifices. But he says, to what purpose are these sacrifices, um, says the Lord. I've had enough of burnt offering of rams and the fat of fed cattle. I do not delight in the blood of bulls or of lambs or of goats. <laughs> when you come to appear before me, who's required this from your hand to trample my courts? Bring no more futile sacrifices. Incense is an abomination to me. The new moons, the Sabbaths, and the calling of assemblies, I cannot endure iniquity and the sacred meeting. So what is his problem with the very sacrifices that he prescribed in order to be approached by his people? The outward appearance is there, but the heart is not, right? The outward appearance is there, but the heart is not. How many people are in our churches that are like that? They're going to church, they're doing things, but Monday to Saturday, you'd never know them as a churchgoer, right? Okay, the outward appearance is there, but the heart is not. What is God always looking at? The heart, okay? When Samuel, the prophet of God, cannot believe that the seven sons of Jesse were not chosen to be the next king, but it's this shepherd boy that's out in the field that not even the father considered as a possibility. What did God tell Samuel? Man's looking at the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. And there's only one of those boys who had the heart of a king, right? And it was the one who didn't have the outward appearance of a king. And whose place is he going to take? King Saul. And what was the description we get of King Saul? He's a head taller than every man in Israel. All the appearances of a warrior king you would want. And yet he's the one trying to put his armor on little boy David to go fight a giant. He doesn't have the heart, right? Doesn't have the heart of a king. All right, verse uh, 14. Your new moons and your appointed feasts, my soul hates. They are trouble to me. I'm weary of bearing them. When you spread out your hands, I will hide my eyes from you. Even though you make many prayers, I will not hear. Your hands are full of blood. So what is the advice to those whose hands are full of blood? 16, wash yourselves. Make yourselves clean. Put away the evil of your doings from before my eyes. Cease to do evil. Learn to do good. Seek justice, rebuke the oppressor, defend the fatherless, plead for the widow. Now, when you go home, I suggest you get your bottle of Mr. Clean and you put on the label there how to be clean. Cease to do evil, learn to do good. Look at these verbs. There's something you have to stop, right? You have to cease your evil, then you have to learn. It's awesome to say to a room full of people showing up on Wednesday night to learn, right? You have to learn. Learn to do good. Notice that's what you have to teach your children, right? Okay? You never teach your children to say no or to say mine, right? But they learn that sometimes faster than mama and dad at, right? You have to teach them to do good. You have to learn to do good. You have to practice doing good. You got to practice it. You got to actually do something about it. Active in doing good. Seek, you got to seek justice, rebuke the oppressor, defend the fatherless, plead for the wi widow. So you have the fatherless and the widow there, the orphan and the widow again. And why does James say that religion becomes pure and perfect when you care for the widow and the orphan? Why them? Why does that perfect your religion? Because you'll minister to them knowing that they can't pay you back, right? 
There's nothing they can do back for you. And that's what purifies your religion is that this is a truly selfless act with no hope of repayment. Okay. So Jesus will say, when you throw a dinner party, invite those who cannot throw a dinner party for you. Because he says, the danger is somebody throws you a dinner party in return. That's a danger because now there's no credit for your dinner party. Okay, so invite those who cannot th uh, throw you a dinner party. Okay. All right, so with all of these charges of sin, wages of sin is death, this constant rebellion that puts him in the Sodom and Gomorrah categories. Okay, all of this rebellion, all this brokenheartedness of God over the people's behavior. Let it shock you that the next verse says this. Come now, let us reason together. Can you imagine facing such rebellion and iniquity and the spitting in your face to hear, come now, let us reason together. In other words, listen, if you don't come back to God, what's the Bible calling you? Unreasonable. Okay? A lack of repentance is just being unreasonable. If you understand the open arms of God, and you're not repenting of your sin and coming back to him, you are utterly unreasonable. Can't be reasoned with. Because listen to the reasoning. What better reasoning could you have of, I'll take all the blame for your mess so you can be clean and you don't come back. Okay? Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, though they, they shall be white as snow, though they are red like crimson, they shall be as wool. So you can see the poetry here, right? The parallelisms, okay, the double use of the red and the scarlet, I'm sorry, the scarlet and the crimson and the snow and the wool. Okay, this is all in poetry. You see how it's kind of set apart from the narrative parts of Isaiah? So uh, really only verse one is in narrative. The rest is in poetry. Do you see how it's kind of put in your Bible differently, written differently in your Bible? You see how it's letting you know it's poetry? Does anybody see what I'm talking about? All right, good. All right, because uh, one of my professors in seminary, the, the gentleman that taught you the second week here, who knows Hebrew certainly better than I do, he had made the comment that the, um, the Hebrew, I'm sorry, the poetry of Isaiah makes Shakespeare look like a kindergartner. Okay. All right. Now, verse 19, if you are willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. If you refuse and rebel, you shall be devoured by the sword, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. All right, first of all, see, see you, can, you can sense the poetry just in the rhythm of that, by the way, because sometimes the poetry is not about rhyming words, although there are some rhyming Hebrew words here, but it, it's more about the rhyming of ideas and the rhythm of how it reads. And they would, the prophets would speak in these ways. Why do you think? easy to remember. They speak in these rhythmic poet, po uh, poetic ways. It, it helps them to, to memorize these things. So here's the rhythm. If you're willing and obedient, two things, then you shall eat the good of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, see how those are the opposite. If you're, it's the difference between being willing and refusing, right? Opposites. If you're obedient or you rebel, they're opposites, okay? So it's, it's, it's a, if you, then I will. If you do not, then I, I won't type of thing. So if you do, if you're willing and obedient, you'll eat the good of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, you'll be devoured by the sword. And what's the certainty of that that's getting, given? For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. That's the end of that. Now, what's this picture of being devoured by the sword? Well, in Revelation 19:15. This vision of Jesus on a white horse um, at the second coming of Christ, it says this, now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword that with it he should strike the nations. So there's the sword of the judgment from his mouth that Isaiah is talking about here. Okay. Um, all right. I, I know I'm going to be pressed for time to get where I want to get. So let's go to, uh, let's go to chapter five. And what I want to try to do with sharing chapters one and five is this, simply setting 
the spiritual condition of Israel. Because if you notice, we're getting words from Isaiah, through Isaiah, from the Lord. Word of the Lord through Isaiah to his people. And yet Isaiah hasn't received his calling yet. When does he receive his calling? Not till chapter six. Okay. So there's two ways people see this. One way is that the first five chapters is just setting the spiritual tone of Israel so you can see why God called his prophet. Others believe the calling came first, uh, and then these oracles in chapters one through five came later in time, but Isaiah wrote them first to set the tone. Okay, so they may not be chronological, uh, just simply setting the spiritual condition. Now, I want to go to chapter 5 for a couple reasons. One is uh, Jesus uh, refers back to, to this chapter. So let's take a look at how this works. So as we continue with the criticisms of Israel, uh, chapter 5 says, Now let me sing, a, sing to my well-beloved a song of my beloved regarding his vineyard. Okay, so this is a song of Isaiah to God about his vineyard says, my well-beloved has a vineyard on a very fruitful hill. He dug it up and cleared out its stones and planted it with the choicest vine. He built a tower in its midst and also made a wine press in it. So he expected it to bring forth good grapes, but it brought forth wild grapes. Okay. So I always like looking at the verbs. Okay. So, so what did this owner of the vineyard do? He dug it up. He cleared out the stones. He planted it with the choicest vine. Planting in the Bible is always a picture of death and resurrection. Okay, Doesn't Paul tell us that uh, actually Jesus will say in John's gospel, unless a seed falls to the ground and dies, it'll never become a crop, right? What, what's the seed he's referring to? Himself. He's the seed that's got to go into the ground and die before it yields a, a crop. It's his death and resurrection that's going to yield this crop, this harvest. So he dug it up, so, um, it, but it brought forth wild grapes. And now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge, please, between me and my vineyard. What more could have been done to my vineyard that I have not done in it? God's saying I've done everything so they could have life and godliness, right? Done everything I had to do for them to, to thrive. Why then, when I expected to bring forth good grapes, did it bring forth wild grapes? And now please let me tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will take away its hedge and it shall be burned. And I'll break down its wall and it shall be trampled down. I will lay it waste. It shall not be pruned or dug and there shall come up briars and thorns Okay, where have you heard briars and thorns before? It's a curse on the man, right? The land will produce for you briars and thorns as part of the curse. And now here's a, a reintroduction of the curse coming on the land. I will also command the clouds that they rain no rain on it. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel. So now the unmasking of the riddle. So now we know straight from the Lord's mouth what the vineyard is. It's the house of Israel. And the men of Judah are his pleasant plant. So the house of Israel will be the northern kingdom, and the men of Judah will be the southern kingdom, is his pleasant plant. He looked for justice, but behold, oppression, for righteousness, but behold, a cry for help. Okay, so what are the good grapes that he planted and expected to be able to, to reap? Justice and righteousness, right? But what are the sour grapes that it yielded? Oppression and a lack of justice. Cry for help instead. All right. Um, let us go to chapter six. Oh, I found my sticky. All right. All right. There it is. Okay. Now, let's uh, let's go to verse twenty-five of chapter five and start there. 
525. Therefore, the anger of the Lord is aroused against his people. He has stretched out his hand against them. Hear that? He stretched out his hand against them and stricken them, and the hills trembled. Their carcasses were as refuse in the midst of the streets. For all this, his anger is not turned away, but his hand is stretched out still. There's two ways you can hear that. His anger is not turned away, but his hand is stretched out still towards judgment. But his hand will stretch out again one day, correct? On the cross to receive a nail when he comes with mercy, right? It's a stretched out hand of God. He will lift up a banner to the nations from afar and will whistle to them from the end of the earth. Surely they shall come with speed, swiftly. No one will be weary or stumble among them. No one will slumber or sleep, nor will the belt of their loins be loosed, nor the strap of their sandals be broken, whose arrows are sharp and all their bows bent. Their horses' hooves will seem like flint and their wheels like a whirlwind. Their roaring will be like a lion. They will roar like young lions. They, yes, they will roar and lay hold of the prey. They will carry it away safely and no one will deliver. And that day they will roar against them like the roaring of the sea. And if one looks to the land, behold, darkness and sorrow, and the light is darkened by the clouds. Now, does this mean that darkness We'll have the last word. Is sin finally going to hold its sway over man and usher in death? And if so, what does this mean about the promises of God? This is very dark, correct? A very hopeless presentation of the moral character of Israel. This is the scene from which God will call forth his prophet to announce to Israel that there will be a virgin birth and a savior will be born out of this condition, this awful, awful condition of God's people. Now, um, okay, let's go into the call of Isaiah, Isaiah chapter six. So this is what Isaiah is called into. It's this incredible apostasy of Israel. It says, in the year that King Uzziah died, and here's why I love that, because the Bible is always inviting you to historically search out the truths of these stories. In other words, the Bible, almost in a tiresome way, is giving you names, dates, and places constantly. So much so that I bet you a lot of you skip right over that stuff just to get to the meat of the stories, right? Constantly, names, dates, and places. And how often do you have to read page after page of genealogies? This guy was born to this guy, 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 page after page of these things. The Bible's pinpointing the historicity of these stories. Okay? Can you imagine a fiction writer just making up all these names and dates and places? And, and especially when that audience is alive when he's writing, it'd be like, who in the heck are you talking about? Right? Okay, it's like you can't make it up when you're you're pinpointing name states and places if you're trying to get away with a lie are you going to give many name states and places to your lie no you're going to get found out right okay so in the year that king uzziah died which we know to be in 740 bc and isaiah is about 25 years old when he receives the call so isaiah is born around 765 bc and he receives this calling in the year of king uzziah's death 740 bc making him 25 years old and he says this, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Okay, keep that in mind now. Isaiah's vision is, he sees the Lord high and lifted up. He sees him in his glory. He's got this heavenly vision of God, and he sees the train of his robe. So the train of his uh, king's robe was indicating his, his majesty. They had like these long robes indicating the majesty that they were claiming. Well, the train of his robe fills the temple. Do you have any idea how big this temple is? This enormous city blocks long temple. What kind of train could fill a temple like that? Speaking of his infinite majesty, right? 
the infinite majesty represented by the train of his robe, fills the temple. Above it stood seraphim. Each one had six wings. With two, he covered his face. With two, he covered his feet. And with two, he flew. Now, the idea there is with two wings, these seraphim cover their face. In other words, not even the seraphim can look into the face of God in all of his glory. They cover their face in God's presence. With two, he covered his feet. I believe the idea there is your feet are usually the sign of your creatureliness, that you're not the creator, you're a creature. Your feet are what connect you to the earth from the dust that you're made from, right? Your feet are the connecting point between where you came from, the dust, where you'll return, the dust. Um, your feet are a sign of that, that you're, you're, it's your humility. Your feet show your humility, that you're connected to the dust of the earth. You're not the creator, you're the creation. So they cover their feet. Just remember Moses had to take off his sandals standing on holy ground. He had to connect his feet to the dust in the presence of God, right? Well, they're covering their feet with two wings. And with two, they flew. I don't think that needs much explanation. You've seen enough birds and stuff like that to see that. And one cried out to another and said, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of whole hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Now, I'm sure in this room, we could name many, many attributes of God. Talk about his love. You could talk about his kindness, his tender mercies, his long suffering and his patience. You could talk about his omnipotence, his omniscience, his omnipresence. You could talk about all these sorts of attributes of God. But the only one of those attributes that's celebrated with this threefold song is his holiness. Because holiness is his key attribute. And that key attribute of God's holiness is what he's calling us to, to be holy as he is holy. Okay, the thing that he's celebrated in heaven the most for is what he's calling us to in, this, in holiness. The whole earth is full of his glory. Now, what's it like to witness the holiness of God? There's no way that I'm going to be able to present this in a way that does it justice. we got to just do our best, all right? So let's take the words of Scripture and try to see what is it like to be confronted with the holiness of God. Well, Isaiah starts with this. It says, And the posts of the door were shaken by the voice of him who cried out, and the house was filled with smoke. Okay? Now, you'd be pretty impressed if when I opened my mouth, the, whole, the doors post started shaking and the room filled with smoke, right? You'd be like, you probably should listen to this guy, right? Okay? Um, so Isaiah says, so I said, woe is me, for I am undone. Now, I read this, and I need to verify it, but I'm going to put it out there publicly just in case it's right. How do you like that for, for credibility? Um, that we've already experienced five woes in the first five chapters. Or I'm sorry, six woes in the first five chapters. And this is the seventh woe. And what is the seventh woe? It's Isaiah pronouncing a woe upon himself. Okay, he's pronounced, what is it, what's an oracle of woe? Well, prophets were known to give two types of oracles, one of weal and one of woe. The oracle of weal is the blessings. The oracle of woe is the warnings of judgment. And so he says, woe is me. He pronounces this woe upon himself. Why? Because he's getting a glimpse of God. And this glimpse of God and the holiness that he's called to, he sees every bit of him that's not going in that direction, that's not holy, that's undone. He's completely undone. And at what point does he notice where he's undone? His lips. He says, I'm a man of unclean lips. Now, what office is he going to be called to in this chapter? The office of prophet, right? He's going to need his lips, right? So the very place God is going to use him is the place he recognizes he's the most undone. He needs redemption in this area before he can be God's prophet. Okay, He's got to be dealt with. His sin has got to be dealt with. He says, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. Why does he feel this way? He says, for my eyes have seen the king, the Lord of hosts. Okay, So now, Isaiah is 25 years old. For 25 years, he seemed pretty comfortable with who he was, right? 
Now, all of a sudden, he's pronouncing a woe upon himself. Listen, he's having an experience. He's having an experience that we should all invite upon ourselves. And that is just getting a glimpse of God. Just give me a glimpse. And what will be your response be to that glimpse? It'll be see yourself as you truly are. And now let me tell you something. That might be the scariest thing you've ever seen in your life. But what will be the result of that? You will fall in love with Jesus like you never have before. Okay? Let me show you this in Mark chapter 4. Mark chapter 4. I think this is, uh, this is why paying attention, paying, paying attention to the words of the Bible, not just the meta narrative of the Bible, not just the big picture of the stories of the Bible, but the words of the Bible to really pay attention. Let's look at uh, Mark 4 here. I'm going to start in verse 35. Mark 4, 35. And there we read this. On the same day when evening had come, Jesus said to them, let's cross over to the other side. Now, when they left the multitude, they took him along in the boat as he was. And the other little boats were also with him. And a great windstorm arose. And the waves beat into the boat so that it was already filling. But he was in the stern asleep on a pillow. And they awoke him and said to him, teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? So what do they think is happening to them? They're dying. And who are these guys? These are guys that live on this lake. They are fishermen of these waters. They're on this water many times a week, if not every day. And they've been in storms on this water. But they recognize this storm as what? One that they cannot survive. They know from this storm that they'll be at the bottom of this lake before the night's over and they'll never see their family and friends again. This is the storm that will kill them. Okay? Okay. So they scream at Jesus, who seems not to be bothered by the life-threatening situation. And they scream at him, teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? Then he arose, and he rebuked the wind, and he said to the sea, peace be still. Remember what I said I like the verbs? What are the verbs here? He arose, he rebuked, and he said, what did he rebuke? The wind, what did he speak to? The sea. Now listen, if you come up to me and you say, hey, I have this friend, and he was rebuking the ocean and speaking to the sea, I would give you numbers to call for help, okay? All right, that's somebody who needs some, some attention, okay? But why, why, don't, why doesn't that stop us when we read this and go, what did Jesus just do? And how would you feel if you're in the boat and he got up and started having conversations with the weather. Okay? What could be weirder than that? I don't know. Maybe the weather listening and obeying. Not a little weirder? Okay, so this is what happens. Then he arose and he rebuked the wind. And he said to the city, peace, be still. And the wind ceased. And there was a great calm. But he said to them, why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? And I love verse 41, because now they're safe and, the, and the, the sea is calm and they know they're going to live. They'll see their families again. Yet it says this, and they feared exceedingly. They're scareder now than when they thought they were going to die. Why? Because they say this. They feared exceedingly and said to one another, what manner of man is this? that even the wind and the sea obey him. Who in the heck is in our boat right now? Okay? Who in the world must this man be? Because I assure you that people have seen miracles of healing before. They've seen the, some of the miracles that Jesus, even the water to wine, didn't, didn't uh, Pharaoh's servants imitate some of those miracles of Moses? And so they've seen these, some things like this, but they've never seen what they just saw. And it's scarier than a life-threatening storm, okay? Their fear became exceeding when they realized exactly who was in the boat with them. 
They caught a glimpse. What was Peter's reaction when he had the great catch of fish? Did he sign Jesus up on a contract to go fishing every Saturday with him? You know, I've been saying that for years, by the way, and the chosen took that line from me. Did you notice that? Peter's walking with Jesus after a great catch of fish. He goes, hey, you want to do this again next Saturday? We can get a little business going. I have said that for years before that show. I should be a writer. I have said that for years. I've got witnesses in the back too. I have said that for a long time. All right, anyways. <laughs> so John Calvin said this, hence that dread and, ter and, and terrible moment which holy men of old trembled before God as scripture uniformly relates. It says, hence that dread and terror which holy men of old trembled before God as scripture uniformly relates. The holy men of old, when they caught a glimpse of God, experienced great, great fear. Not because God was going to get them, but listen, there's a picture of his holiness that I don't think we fully grasp. When John sees him in Revelation, John, the same John that walked with him for three years, for three years, John walked with this Jesus. Then he sees him in heaven. And he falls on his face as a dead man. He has no life left in him. And it takes the touch of Jesus on his shoulder to say, do not be afraid. So when you pray, what's your picture of Jesus? Okay, how do you see him? I don't know what to tell you about that, except this. Okay, You know that there's a heat that you could experience that's so hot, it would kill you, correct? You know that there's a cold so frigid that if you experienced it, it would kill you, correct? You know there's an evil so wicked that if you experienced it, you would die. But did you know there's a holiness so pure that if you experienced it, you would perish right now? Okay, it's the other point of that compass, isn't it? That's the holiness of God. It is that awesome. And the only way you can be in his presence is you've got to become glorified. You've got to take on a new form. And so when you read in the Bible that the last part of your salvation is your glorification, that's your preparation to be in the presence of this type of weighty awesomeness forever. And then instead of fear, you'll have great joy in that. Okay. All right. Back to Isaiah 6. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having his hand a live coal, which had, had been taken with the tongs from the altar, and he touched my mouth with it. This is, a this is a coal too hot for an angel to touch. So he takes the tongs and he presses this burning coal upon the lips of Isaiah. Can you imagine the blistering and the searing pain of that? This is the purging of his sin. It's the coal has been mentioned as a type of the gospel. Okay. Um, the, the purging aspect of the, of the gospel. Uh, Luther, Martin Luther believed that Isaiah actually died and was revived by this fiery coal of the gospel. And Eastern Orthodoxy said the coal was a symbol of the Eucharist, of the body and bl blood of Christ. They're looking at what healed Isaiah. So as Isaiah's sin is cured, the question is, what did we just read in the first five chapters? Israel is sick with sores, putrefying sores and bruises from head to toe, correct? Can that be healed now? Can that be healed? Just as Isaiah's sinful condition is healed, can Israel now be healed? Verse 8, also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send and who will go for us? Then I said, here am I, send me. Now, what can change a man from woe is me to here am I, send me? It's that coal of the gospel, right? Um. You know, I say this often and probably yet not often enough. One of the great joys of dealing with the addiction community 
is you see the woe is me aspect of them. And then you get to see the here am I, send me. Because I've encountered the gospel. And they're not the same anymore. Now, what type of message did Isaiah, the prophet of the southern kingdom, just sign up for? So he says, here am I, send me. And God said, okay, go and tell this people, <laughs> go and tell this people, keep on hearing, but do not understand. Keep on seeing, but do not perceive. Make the heart of this people dull and their ears heavy and shut their eyes, lest they see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and return and be healed. That's his message. His message is going to harden your hearts. What is that? Don't you think Isaiah is saying, here he is, send him now. Okay, listen, by the way, these words of judgment, by the way, uh, should be spoken at your churches, okay? Um, even if it means your pastor gets on in half one day. Okay. Now, how do you think our country is doing morally? What do you think the oracles would be if God sent us a prophet today? Okay. Would you be a part of the remnant that God was going to save if he was going to destroy Broward County? Okay. These things you got to consider. Now, what kind of message is this? Well, I was looking for help on how to explain this. And Al J. Alec Motyer, incredible book on Isaiah, said it better than anybody that I've read or certainly better than I could say about this oracle here. He says this, the use of these verses in the New Testament is an additional reason to be concerned. In other words, Jesus, when he taught in parables, his apostle says, why are you teaching in parables? And he points at the Pharisees, says, because it's not for them to know. Okay? This is for you to know, not for them to know. So I teach in parables. He says, so that, and then he quotes Isaiah. So hearing they don't understand, so seeing they don't see, lest they turn and repent and I would heal them. In other words, I have no intention of healing them, no intention of accepting their repentance. Did you know there's a time it could be too late? There is. I'll show you. Hold on. Let me, uh, let me quote Alec Montier here. The use of these verses in the New Testament where Jesus spoke them that I just quoted is an additional reason to be concerned to interpret these verses correctly and a simple approach lies to hand. How did I, Isaiah obey these? How did he obey this call? According to the criticism leveled against him in chapter 28, verses 9 and 10, Isaiah taught with such simplicity and clarity that the sophisticates of his day scorned him as fit only to conduct a kindergarten class. In other words, in chapter 28, they say, what you teach is so simple. Why don't you teach something more complex? It's so simple. But what was the simplicity of his message? You're going to be judged. Okay. So in other words, Isaiah is speaking plainly and clearly. We shouldn't look at this very difficult oracle and say, well, there's got to be some deeper meaning. Saying no, he's speaking perfectly clear here. The Isaianic literature as it has come to us bears all the marks of a plain, systematic, reasoned approach. It is clear that Isaiah did not understand his commission as one to blind people by obscurity of expression or complexity of message. He's not trying to be obscure so they don't understand. He's not trying to overcomplicate things so they don't understand. He's being crystal clear. He, in fact, faced the preacher's dilemma. What's the preacher's dilemma? If hearers are resistant to the truth, the only recourse is to tell them the truth yet again, more clearly than before. But to do this is to expose them to the risk of rejecting the truth yet again and therefore of increased hardness of their hearts. It could even be that the next rejection they experience will prove to be the point at which the heart is hardened beyond recovery. 
The human eye cannot see this point in advance. It comes and goes unnoticed. But the all-sovereign God knows both it and appoints it as he presides in perfect justice over the psychological processes that he created. It was at just such a point that Isaiah was called to his office. His task was to bring the Lord's word with fresh, even unparalleled clarity. But in their response, people would reach the point of no return. The imperatives of these verses must therefore be seen as expressing an, an inevitable outcome of Isaiah's ministry. And of course, so it turned out to be, as is made clear in chapters 7 through 11. These were the days in which the decisive word was spoken and refused. Opportunity in human life is as often judgment as it is salvation. There's opportunities in life just as often lead to judgment as they do to salvation. So what is uh, Dr. Motyer here saying? It's saying they've had so many chances and they continue to rebel. Remember, God said, I brought up children and I nourished them, right? But they have rebelled. Now, is it a New Testament truth that hearts could be hardened? Now, remember, I'm not saying people are born and then God just hardens their heart because they just weren't picked. I am not saying that at all. What I'm saying is God does not owe us the rest of our lives to stop kicking him to the curb. He doesn't owe us the rest of our lives to stop blaspheming him or knowing about the cross and saying, I don't believe it. Okay? He doesn't owe us anything. Everything is of grace and mercy. Okay? Everything is of grace and mercy. He doesn't owe us any of that. So in Hebrews chapter 6, doesn't get preached a lot because you're going to get uncomfortable with it. it says, verse 4, 6-4, for it is impossible for those who were once enlightened. Remember, God said, I nourished them and brought them up. They're once enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift and have been partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come. If they fall away to renew them again to repentance, since they crucify again for themselves, the son of God and put him to open shame. In other words, listen, God is not somebody to be toyed with. He is so holy that the holy men of old were struck with horror when they caught a glimpse. Okay? This is the same God that stretches out his arms on a cross to say, just whoever believes will be forgiven. Okay? We don't get that side of the coin very often. And what does that produce? A society just like we live in. Okay? a society just like we live in, if we don't take seriously the holiness of God and who he is, and that the wages of sin is death, death is what he owes us, yet he's willing to exchange his death for your death. And the rejection of that is the most serious crime ever committed. It's not forgivable. Okay? Murder, it's forgivable. Okay? Adultery, forgivable. Okay. To reject the God that you know about when he's reaching out his hands to save you is not. Because if it were, my question would be this. Who would be the one forgiving you? Who could it possibly be forgiving you if you've rejected Jesus? There is nobody left for your forgiveness. Okay. There's one mediator between God and man, and it's Christ Jesus. I am the way and the truth and the life, and nobody comes to the Father but through me, says Jesus. Okay? And that one way is sufficient for all. Do you agree? That one way is sufficient for all. But God is, Jesus is not, by the way, this picture of God we're getting here, Okay, high and lifted up, sitting on his throne, the train of his robe filling the temple. Okay, don't have time to elaborate on this, but I'll start with this next week. But to give you a taste of that, John 12, John 12, let's start in verse 37. How does John use this passage of Isaiah? 
John 12, 37 says, but although Jesus had done so many signs before them, they did not believe in him. That the word of Isaiah the prophet might be fulfilled, which he spoke, Lord, who has believed our report, and to whom has the armor of the Lord been revealed? Therefore, they could not believe. You hear that word? Therefore, they could not believe because Isaiah said again, he has blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts, lest they should see with their eyes, lest they should understand with their hearts in turn, so that I should heal them. Now listen to the verse 41. These things Isaiah said when he saw his glory and spoke of him. What is he pointing at? When, I, when did Isaiah see his glory? It says when this quote happened. That quote comes from Isaiah 6. Isn't that the same chapter where he, Isaiah sees God's glory? But now this says, Isaiah, when he saw God on his throne and the train of his robe filling the temple, this says that was Jesus that he saw. That was Jesus. And what I say about the, the train of his robe, what's it reflect? His infinite majesty. Okay, are you with me right now? Because here's how we're going to close. Look at John 13. John 13 is the Last Supper. The washing of the apostles' feet. Verse 2. And supper being ended, the devil having already put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going to God, what did he do? He rose from supper and laid aside his garments. What's his garments that he'd be wearing? His rabbinical robe. His rabbinical robe. And when was the last time we saw this robe? It's in Isaiah 6, and it was filling the train of the temple. I'm sorry. It was filling, his train was filling the temple. And what is he doing in John 13? He's removing that robe of majesty. He's removing that robe of majesty. Okay, that was seen by Isaiah in Isaiah 6. And now Jesus becomes a man and he puts on just the typical rabbi's robe. It's part of his humility. Think, think of the, how these robes, he exchanged the one robe in Isaiah 6 for the robe he's wearing as a rabbi in John 13. And he removes that robe that symbolizes his majesty that Isaiah saw to do what? To do the lowest job of the lowest servants, to wash their feet. You see his humility? The same God that, that his voice, the doorpost of the temple shook, smoke filled the room. That Isaiah caught a glimpse of that and pronounced a woe upon himself. That same God removes that robe to wash the apostles' feet. He says, you call me Lord and Master, and you do well, for so I am your Lord and Master. And if I, your Lord and Master, have washed your feet, then you should wash one another's as well. I did this as an example for you. So who are we? not to serve each other. Who are we to not serve one another? When the one that Isaiah saw in his glory, Philippians 2 said he emptied himself and became a bondservant. This is the one that Isaiah saw in his glory. He emptied himself, became a bondservant, obedient to death, even the death of the cross. Therefore, God highly exalted him. And gave him the name that's above every name. And if you said to the Jewish audience of Paul, what's the name above every name? What would they say? Yahweh. But it says he was given the name that's above every name. And now listen to what Paul says next. That at the name of Jesus. So who is Jesus? Yahweh. The name of Jesus. Every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. Isaiah 45, at least five or six times, God says in Isaiah 45, I am the Lord and there is no other. And the last time that he says in Isaiah 45, says, I am the Lord and there is no other. And at my name, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. That's what Yahweh said in Isaiah 45. Paul says, at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. Okay? 
these inspired writers clearly saw Jesus is our God. Let's pray. So Lord, it's in Jesus' name we come. Lord, and I pray with fear and trembling that this was a faithful uh, teaching to you, Lord. And I pray that that your truth would envelop our hearts, Lord, and change us so that we could be good grapes, Lord, in your vineyard, entirely useful to you. Lord, we, we ask that we could put our lives aside so that you could live through us that our lives would bring you great glory. And Lord, that we would confess our sins readily to you. Because if we're faithful to confess, you tell us in your word you're faithful to forgive and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So Lord, we praise you as a group tonight. Receive our worship, Lord. Receive our praise. You are our king and you are glorious. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Quick question from the online audience. Uh, do you mind uh, giving the, the title of the book and the author again? We had several people asking about it. Yeah, it's called The Prophecy of Isaiah, an Introduction and Commentary by J. Alec Motyer, M-O-T-Y-E-R, M-O-T-Y-E-R. All right, there we go. Uh, so let's dive into the real questions here, uh, Pastor Bill, from tonight. Uh, the first question reads, what can be said about the prophecies from Isaiah that have not come true yet? Such as, I'm not sure which ones haven't. Oh, like, okay, so there's some about the millennial reign and, and so forth. And, and some of the prophecies of Isaiah, we, we have to wait for, for the uh, end times. Um, if they're not end times prophecies, they're all fulfilled uh, through uh, up, up to the point of Christ. There was, you know, we're going to get into some of these prophecies, Isaiah 7, Isaiah 9, uh, probably next week. Um, but the only ones I can think of that would be fulfilled is there's, you know, some millennial verses and end times verses and so forth. And, and if I knew the day and the hour, those would be fulfilled. Then I'd be violating Jesus's thought that nobody knows that, right? So uh, the end times verses have not been fulfilled. Good evening. So I have a question in regards to the warning against apostasy. So in Hebrews chapter six, uh, we were just uh, reading, it says, for it's impossible in the case of those who have once been enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gifts and have shared in the Holy Spirit and have tasted the goodness of the word of God and the powers of the age to come. So it sounds as if these people were true believers and, and saved. So if they fall back um, and they, they, as you were talking about, they reject the God that they once knew, ha is their salvation rescinded? Or is it one of those things where it's once saved, always saved? Yeah, I don't, I don't read it that way. I, I see the words tasted and... Um... Words like that. Uh, let me look at the actual words. Um, so they were once enlightened, uh, tasted the heavenly gift, become partakers of the Holy Spirit, tasted the good word. So I don't know so much about partakers, but certainly uh, the words um, tasted that are used twice there, tasted the heavenly gift, tasted the good word of God. Um, I think largely that's understood to mean they didn't consume it, they just tasted. Like when you taste something, you're not fully partaking of it, you're just sampling type of thing. So these are people that have gone to church, took communion, tasted the heavenly gift, things like that, but they weren't fully invested. They weren't truly in it, no matter what it looked like, because that would explain John's statement, I believe it's uh, in First John, where he says, those who were amongst us, who went out from us, weren't really of us. So he's talking about the surprise of some that participated in their community that left. 
And his explanation of that is they weren't really of us. So that to me, that means they just tasted and kind of sampled, but we don't really know who's tasting and sampling. We just assume they're, they're us. But John explains that uh, they weren't of us. So um, I think it was Augustine who explained it by saying, there's the visible church and the invisible church. And he described the visible church of the people that you can see. And the invisible church is the church that only God can see, which means those who are true believers, who really are invested. And that will endure to the end uh, type of thing. But there are people that participate in church that aren't fully invested. And you've seen that. You've seen people that, you know, served and they, you know, they could be deacons, they could be anything. And, and then they're completely uninterested uh, later. And John's explanation is they weren't really uh, of us. So that, that's how I understand that passage is that category of people there. And by the way, that passage in Hebrews 6, I didn't read this, but I think the next couple of verses explain, help explain this dynamic. It's verse 7 says, For the earth which drinks in the rain that often comes upon it and bears herbs useful for those by whom it is cultivated receives blessing from God. But if it bears thorns and briars, that's the words of Isaiah. Remember the thorns and briars of Isaiah? It is rejected and near to being cursed whose end is to be burned. So here he compares this idea of those who are once enlightened and now are fallen away. He compares it to the picture of the earth drinking in rain. So the, so, so the rain's falling, yet the earth sometimes bears herbs that are useful to be cultivated. And sometimes it produces thorns and briars, which are only good to be burned. So the idea is you can't blame the rain. It's not the rain's fault that these different things came up. It's the soil's fault. The various soils produce the various outcomes. The rain's all the same though, right? The rain is typically symbolic of the word of God. That's all the same. But Jesus in, in his parables will say, our hearts have four different conditions to them, that they're different soils, right? There's a good soil, a thorny soil, a rocky soil, and sometimes the word of God misses the soil altogether, right? So it's the soils that determine what's sprouting up. Not, it's not the rain's fault or, or that, which um, again, I think the writer of Hebrews is playing into that by saying, sometimes you get good stuff, sometimes you get bad stuff, but the rain's all the same. The word is the same, the offer is the same, but the condition of the heart that receives that offer is what varies and produces the different outcomes. Okay. Thank you, Pastor Bill. Uh, the next question from the online audience says, uh, earlier you were referring to the unforgivable sin. Does this mean backsliders cannot come back and be forgiven? See, that's where, I, you know, you have to know the condition of the, the heart, the soil, which obviously I wouldn't know. So if they're an actual, if, if, the, if, if they die known as a backslider, then yeah, they're not in good shape. But uh, people that have backslidden come back, right? We've seen that too. So, you know, these are all dynamics that happen and we see them happen. And so we don't know the condition of those people's hearts and we don't know if they'll leave again or, or what their deal is. But, um, uh, you know, a true backslider, if that's what they are, if that's who they're going to be till the end, because remember, those who endure to the end are saved, right? So the backslider of the backslides to the end is not, you know, type of thing. It's kind of how you finish. You know, that's why Paul says, I finished the race. I've completed the race. I've won the prize. You know, I've gotten through the tape of the, of the finish line here uh, type of thing. So uh, we just don't know until, until the Lord takes us, you know, what the true condition of our heart will be. Are we going to make it to the end or not? You know, type of thing. That's why your spiritual disciplines are so important. Because you get strengthened through those disciplines of Bible reading and worship and church attendance. And those all build up your spirit. They make you stronger. Fasting really makes you stronger. Okay. So, um, yeah. So those things are crucial. I think we had a question here. You have a question yep. here. Let's get you on the mic. Yeah. So everyone online needs you. to hear you. So. The scripture about um, his word will not come back void. I'm wondering if it's kind of misused 
because basically it's providing, it's like what you were saying with rain, it's an opportunity for judgment or salvation. So either way, it's accomplishing God's purpose. Yeah, I think that's right. Yeah. I think that's right. And I think, um, you know, as she's saying, you know, the promise is God's word will not turn back void. It will, it will accomplish what it set out to do. And that's why I like what Alec Montier said is, uh, sometimes the outcomes are for judgment and not not for salvation, you know, but it's going to accomplish whichever way it sets out to go. Um, and what I want you to know about the hardening of the hearts, um, I actually, uh, it's the first time I've ever referred anybody to my own work. That's really weird to do. But I wrote a paper several years ago on obduracy. Uh, obduracy is the dynamic of hardening hearts, blinding eyes and deafening ears and hardening hearts and all of that. And as I searched the scriptures to write this paper, I always found opportunity for the heart not to be hardened. In Pharaoh, in, in, in uh, you know, Judas is walking with the same Jesus as everybody. And, you know, somebody's got to betray him, but I don't know that it necessarily had to be that one. You know, we see that his heart was for money and for greed. He stole from the apostles during his three years. We learned that. So um, his heart was ripe for judgment, for betrayal, uh, so to speak. So, uh, so when I had to produce this paper, I was open for, the, for my research to go in any direction, with any conclusion, whatever it was it is. I just want to know what God says, you know, and I want to be open to change my mind when I find I'm wrong. Um, but what I found through that, writing that paper was, I don't think anybody's born without hope. I don't think anybody's born just to be, even the, the difficult words of Romans about creating vessels of clay for ignoble purposes. Well, if you look back in Jeremiah, which Paul is quoting, the potter and the clay that he's quoting there is back in Jeremiah. And when you read it in Jeremiah, God is actually talking about when hearts go astray and they become ignoble, he's the potter that can actually mold them into nobility again. So it's actually referring to our conclusions are the opposite in Romans. But when you see what Paul's referring to, he's saying God can make, you know, either one. And so if it's bad, he has the capability of making it good again. Okay, so I think we get some wrong conclusions on that. Thank you, Pastor Bill. The next question from the online audience is referring to Romans 12, 20. Uh, in that verse, it's speaking of pouring coals onto people's heads. Is that the same thing as purifying coal on Isaiah's lips? Yeah, I've seen some different ideas and commentaries on that. And the one that sticks with me is true. And this is, I can't say I know for certainty, because even the guys that write commentaries uh, on Proverbs, that's a proverb that's being quoted in the New Testament. Um, it seems that they, um, you know, in, in that day, they would ha have like community fires that you could send usually the oldest boy to the community fire with a bucket, and he would scoop up hot coals to bring back to warm the house in the winter. And that they would actually carry that bucket on their head just to warm themselves as they walked back. Or they would show up with it on their head and they would pour hot coals into the bucket on their head. And the idea there is that it could warm them. It would, it would warm them. So when it says that by so doing, you pour hot coals on their head, it may actually mean that those words can actually turn them and warm them. Uh, just like Proverbs will say, a, a soft answer turns back wrath. So to be kind of that picture so of the hot coals. And that needs explanation because, you know, I hate for people to go really mad at you when my Bible says to pour hot coals on your head. And so, you know, I'm just being faithful. <laughs> you know, that's what I'm doing. So, um, yeah, so we need, yeah. So uh, I don't think it's saying that for sure. So, um, so the answer would be yes, because as if, if my understanding of the hot coals on the head is right, the idea is the angry person's warmed by your response and they change just like isaiah went from a condition of woe and the hot coal served to purify him how many of these do we have i'm curious because i could imagine a hundred from tonight's teaching i'm just yeah we uh honestly we're probably pretty much out of time with the exception of one more in person from the live okay. audience do we have one more question thank you for pastor bill for always pointing to jesus uh just a question on clarification 
in chapter one, when you were talking about the prophecies, they gave prophecies that were easily interpreted, seen in their own time. In chapter one, you would point out the differences between Sodom and Gomorrah. There was a remnant saved from Sodom. There was not a remnant from Gomorrah. Could you clarify, was that something that the early readers could identify with? There was a remnant saved from Judah, and there was no remnant saved from Israel? Um, I'm not sure he's making the parallel that um, Judah is Sodom and um, Israel is Gomorrah. I think it's all for Judah. I think it's a cry from Judah. I think these oracles are not uh, from Israel unless I missed something or didn't notice them. Do you see Israel mentioned in, in one, in that section? So... Yeah, no, the, the only indication is from verse one, where he talks about serving the kings of Judah as their prophet. So I don't think Israel's brought into the picture until a future chapter. Do you see Israel in chapter one? Yeah, it, when you read through Isaiah and Jeremiah and them, it the transitions happen so quickly of who the audience is. You really got to see, really be careful to take note of who they're addressing. The transitions happen quite quickly. And a lot of Bibles do a pretty good job of putting subtitles over those sections and saying, you know, this is to Judah, this is to Ephraim, this is to, you know, whomever, Egypt, Assyria, or whoever. But it, it, I don't see anything there that would take it outside of Judah in chapter one. So I think they get both the Sodom and the Gomorrah is the worry there. We can take a question right here real quick, Mike. I want to shake his. Um, how you doing, man? Good. Um, my question is, you know how you said that Jesus speaks in parables and it's not for them to understand? If I'm not wrong, sometimes the apostles, they didn't understand what he was saying because he was speaking in parables. So who is he talking to about understanding these parables? Like who... The like, Pharisees. Yeah. Well, the apostles, um, when they ask for clarification on the parables, they they need clarification because you know, they don't understand the teaching. But what Jesus is saying is, I can speak out loud in these parables in the presence of the Pharisees, and they won't get it because their hearts are not right. But you're going to get it. Even if I got to clarify a thing or two for you, you're going to understand because your heart is open. So it doesn't mean they're going to have an intellect that doesn't need clarification. It just means they were, their hearts will receive the teaching, or the Pharisees' hearts won't receive the teaching. Okay. All right. Okay, I know you guys want to watch the World Series and all that good stuff, right? So uh, I'll pray us out of here, and we'll see you next week uh, as we're going to get into uh, the um, birth announcement, and there's some really fascinating stuff there. Uh, so we'll look forward to that next week. Um, I, I prayed us out, didn't I? Yes, I did. Okay. Well, God bless you guys. Have a good night. Thank you.